Bible Overview, The Twelve, Prophet Jonah The Twelve, also called the Twelve Prophets or the Minor Prophets, contains the books of Twelve Prophets, Hosea, Joe, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahim, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. In most other versions of the Old Testament, each of these twelve is treated as a separate book, but in the Hebrew Bible, they are consolidated into one book, the last of eight books in the second division of the Hebrew Bible known as the Nevi'im. Minor refers not to their importance but to their length. All were considered important enough to enter the Hebrew Bible, but none was long enough to form an independent book. For example, Obadiah is only a single chapter long, and the longest of these are Hosea and Zechariah, each with 14 chapters. One theme that unifies the Twelve Prophets is Israel's relationship with God. What does God demand of humans? How do historical events signify God's word? These are questions that appear throughout biblical prophecy. But nowhere in the Bible does a single book present as wide a variety of views on these subjects as does the collection of the Twelve Minor Prophets. Here, we will look at what the prophet Jonah has to say. The book of Jonah is a subversive story about a rebellious prophet who had an issue with God for loving his enemies. This book is unique among the other Old Testament, book, Testament books of the prophets because it does not focus on the words of the prophet like the others. Rather, it is a story about a prophet. A really mean and nasty one at that. It is akin to a believer not measuring up in terms of his behaviour. Jonah appeared one other time in the Old Testament during the reign of Jeroboam II, one of Israel's worst kings. He prophesied in favour of Jeroboam II with a promise that the king would win a battle and regain all his territories on northern Israel's northern border. The prophet Amos also confronted Jeroboam II. God specifically reversed Jonah's prediction by prophesying to Amos that the king would lose all those same territories. Therefore, before the story of Jonah even begins, we have a prophet with a highly suspicious character. The book of Jonah has a beautiful design of literary pairing and symmetry. Chapters 1 and 3 tell the story of Jonah's encounter with non-Israelites, firstly some sailors and then the Ninevites his hated enemies, Ninevites, the Ninevites. Each part offers a comic contrast between Jonah's selfishness and the pagans' humility and repentance. Chapters 2 and 4 contain Jonah's prayers. One was a prayer of repentance of sorts, and the other, chewing God out for being too nice. The careful design is matched by a really unique narration style. The story is full of stereotyped characters who ironically do the exact opposite of what you think they would do. This kind of story would fit what we call satire today. It is a story about well-known figures who were placed in extreme circumstances where humour and irony were used to criticise their stupidity and character flaws. For example, like a prophet, a man of God who rebelled against God and had an issue with the goodness of his own God. Pagan sailors, typically immoral, but they had soft, repentant hearts that turned to God in humility. The king, a man who ruled the most powerful and murderous empire on planet Earth, but he humbled himself before God because of Jonah's five-word sermon. Incidentally, the biblical number five stands for grace. It is recorded in Genesis 6-8 that Noah, which means rest, found grace. Trusting God results in rest, and with that rest, we find grace, the unearned, unmerited, and undeserved favours of God. The cows. This may sound hilarious, but even as stubborn as they are, the king's cows repented. The story opens with God addressing Jonah and commissioning him to go preach against the evil and injustice and in Nineveh, the capital city of Israel's bitter enemy, the Assyrian Empire. However, Jonah went 
in the opposite direction instead of going east toward Nineveh. He found a ship that was going as far west as Tashish. Why would Jonah do that? Fear? Dislike for the Ninevites? At this point, the reader is not yet told. Jonah boarded the ship that was full of pagan sailors and eventually he fell asleep. Subsequently, God sent a huge storm to wake him up. Ironically, the sailors were wide awake to all that was happening and could discern divine power at work. They then threw the dice and discovered that Jonah was the reason for the storm. In response to their request to explain himself, Jonah spouted a whole bunch of religious mumbo-jumbo about him being a Hebrew who worshipped the God who created the sea and the dry land and blah blah blah. Yet he was trying to run away from God on a boat. What a joke. He then asked the sailors to throw him overboard in order to save them. As much as it appeared noble on Jonah's part, it was actually his most selfish move yet. How so? What better way to avoid going to Nineveh? He put his blood on the innocent hands of those sailors by forcing them to kill him. It was either he dies or they die. As much as the sailors were reluctant, they repented to God even as they were tossing Jonah overboard. The storm subsided and they ended up fearing the God of Israel. Unlike Jonah, those sailors actually worship God. God foiled Jonah's plan to escape going to Nineveh by providing a strange watery tomb in the form of the stomach of a huge fish. It would be certain death under normal circumstances, but everything was topsy-turvy in this story. Jonah's submarine death became his passage to Nineveh. Cramp in the stomach of the beast, Jonah uttered a prayer. Although he did not technically say sorry, he thanked God for not abandoning him. He then promised God his obedience from that point forward. Consequently, the whale vomited Jonah back onto dry land. Once again, God commissioned Jonah to go and preach to the Ninevites, and he complied. When in Nineveh, Jonah then preached his five-word sermon in Hebrew. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. The sermon was not only short, but odd in that there was no mention of what the Ninevites had done wrong, what they should do to respond, who might overturn the imminent disaster, and importantly, there was no mention of God. Did Jonah intentionally give only the bare minimum information? It would look like he was trying to sabotage his own message to ensure the destruction of Nineveh. Whatever the motive was, his plan did not work out. The king of Nineveh, the entire city, and even the stubborn cows, immediately repented in sorrow and ashes. For the second time, evil pagans have shown themselves to be more responsive than God's own prophet. God eventually forgave and spared the Ninevites. Now, in reflection, Jonah was the type of the Jews who would reject Jesus as a Messiah, so that salvation may come to the Gentile nations. Jesus came for his own, but they received him not. The brilliant part of the story is found in Jonah's five-word sermon. The last word, overturned, means turned over. It can refer to a city being overthrown or destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. But it can also be a reference to something being transformed, turned over and changed into its opposite. Comically, Jonah's words actually came true but not in the way he expected. Nineveh did get turned over, as in transformed, as they repented and found God's mercy. It brings to mind Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, that is turned over and changed into its opposite by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The final chapter brings all the pieces together. Jonah was fuming mad, and he uttered his second prayer. He first told God the reason he ran away from Nineveh back in chapter 1. 
It was not because he was afraid, but that he knew God was merciful. Jonah actually quoted God's description of himself from the book of Exodus, but he was throwing it back on God's face as an insult. He actually insulted God. What audacity! He said he knew God was merciful and that he would find some way to forgive the Ninevites. The disgust in Jonah's voice was deafening. He then cut off the conversation with God and prayed that he would kill him on the spot. Just imagine someone hanging up on you abruptly. Pure rudeness. He would rather die than live with his God who would forgive his enemies. Fortunately for Jonah, God did not answer his prayer. Like a loving and patient father, God asked Jonah if his anger was even justified. While still throwing his tantrums, Jonah ignored the question and went outside the city to camp on a nearby hill, awaiting what would happen next. He was probably hoping for the Ninevites to repent of their repentance and get toasted after all. What a compassionate prophet. While he was still sitting in anger with nostrils flaring, God provided a viny plant to shade Jonah from the sun, which made the whiny little Jonah rather happy. But then God sent a tiny worm to eat up the plant and Jonah lost the shade. There in the heat of the sun, Jonah again asked God to kill him. In response, God asked him for the second time if his anger was justified. To which Jonah barked back, Absolutely just let me die. Those were the last words of Jonah in the story. Now in reflecting what Jonah said, outside the city on a nearby hill, it speaks of Jesus' crucifixion at Golgotha, a hill near Jerusalem. The viney plant. It speaks of Jesus who is the vine and believers the branches. It was a picture of how Jesus is a sap that gives life to the dry branches of a believer, as depicted by Jonah who was under the heat of the day in the form of his own shortcomings and weaknesses. Only Jesus can truly transform a believer from the inside out. The tiny worm. It was an image of the serpent who devours the sinner. Jesus took the place of sinners so that he might be devoured. He willingly laid down his life for us so that we might live. That willingness was portrayed by Jonas's last words. Absolutely, just let me die. Justification for anger. Jesus cried out twice while on the cross. The first cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first cry was justification of God's anger at sin when he unleashed the full force of his wrath and punishment of Jesus as the perfect sacrifice in the place of sinners. The second cry, it is finished. This is the prophetic reason behind Jonas's, Jonah's last words. The second cry was the justification of sinners by the completion of the perfect redemptive work of Jesus. The sin debt has been more than fully paid. It was God's final words that concluded the book. He pointed to the final words of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. God said that the whole vine incident was an attempt to get through to Jonah who got all concerned and emotional over the vine which he only enjoyed for a day. God asked Jonah, Aren't humans a bit more valuable than vines? That question was meant to get Jonah to understand God's mercy and compassion for the Ninevites vis-a-vis sinners. What was Jonah's answer to the question? It is found centuries later in Christ crucified. Humans are so valuable too and loved by God that he even gave up his only beloved son to die for us. The book of Jonah ends with God's underlying love for sinners. From this book, we see that it is God who will always have the final say. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Jonah, we see the worst side of our character magnified. The way God related to Jonah despite his idiot I mean idiosyncrasies, generous humility and gratitude to God who loves his enemies and put up with Jonah that is in all of us. It gives a whole new sense to Romans 5, 6 to 10. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, 
yet perhaps for the good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God loves us not because of our good behaviors. It is because he so loves us that he does not want us to be destroyed by our bad behaviors. The strange story of Jonah is actually a message of the good news about the length, depth, height and width of God's love for sinners who make themselves enemies of God. With this in mind, 1 John 4.10 serves as the fitting conclusion. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen. And that is what the book of Jonah is all about.